Today, we're going to talk about the 10 warning signs of dementia, specifically Alzheimer's. And I have some additional, very important information to share with you that relates to your genetics. For example, if your grandparents or your parents had it, does that mean you're going to have it? I'm also going to touch on some important information relating to the actual cause of um, Alzheimer's. Um, there's been some recent information on the amyloid plaque theory that is completely going to flip things upside down. But before I touch on the warning signs, I just have to say, out of all the stresses that someone experiences, a loss of a loved one, a loss of your mother with Alzheimer's or your father is probably one of the most devastating things that can happen, not just for you, but for them as well. Because you're in a situation where you're gradually losing yourself and you're losing your ability to think and remember and locate things and navigate. So it's very, very unstabling. It's very confusing and it's basically terrifying. My wife's mother had Alzheimer's and Karen was so close to her mom. I mean, it was her best friend. And it was just tragic to go to the nursing home and visit her, to see all these family members trying to communicate and trying to connect with this person that they love. I mean, to this day that Karen just, you know, misses her and she thinks about her um, all the time. So today I'm going to talk about the warning signs and I'm going to give you some things that you can do to hopefully reverse this situation in a loved one and even in yourself. Okay, so with that, let's start with the warning signs first. The first warning sign is a change in language, okay? Uh, coping for different words, trying to look for different words that you can't remember. Um, and just realize as I go through this, it doesn't mean that you have Alzheimer's or dementia. It could be many other reasons. It could be you haven't slept. It could be your blood sugars. It could be a B12 deficiency. It could be many different things. But these are just potential indicators that there could be a problem in this area. When we talk about a problem with language, we also talk about communication. There's uh, problems with communicating to the person. They're not necessarily uh, paying attention. And then when they talk to you, it could be kind of random. And for example, you might ask them a question and you know, a few minutes later, you might get the answer. So there's this lag time. It takes a long time to sink in and to get a response. Number two, navigation. Difficulty finding yourself around uh, town, uh, around your house, things like that. So unfortunately, over time, that can get really bad to the point where you just basically lost all the time. Number three, sensory. So you might have um, a loss of taste, smell, hearing, sight. Number four, constipation. What's interesting about that is my mother-in-law was on a stool softener, right? So realize constipation uh, is part of the gut and there's a gut brain connection there that sensors a two-way uh, communication street. One area can affect the other. All right, number five, personality changes, okay? Um, they weren't like they were before. Their personality is completely altered when you have dementia or Alzheimer's. Number six, mood changes. And this can also occur because of the frustration that they know where they're going. And it's very difficult to get certain words out and remember different things. It can be very frustrating. So that's why it's really important not to correct someone if they make a mistake with words or anything, because that not only frustrates them, but it can actually make it worse. If you're constantly correcting someone, even if they don't have Alzheimer's or dementia, you basically kind of lock it in where they start to do it more and more and more. All right, number seven, memories. Locating pictures and thoughts that you had before are difficult, especially recent memories. Okay, that could be one of the indicators. Number eight, thinking the ability to solve problems. Now, solving problems also involve having a memory of past similar situations that you're drawing on. And if you can't access that data, it's very difficult to solve problems. So if someone can't solve problems, they're gonna have a lot more problems built up and that's gonna be more frustrating. All right, number nine, their overall awareness is affected. So you can kind of even look in their eyes and see that they're not 100% there. They're, that means their attention is not on the environment in the present. It's somewhere else. And number 10, they keep repeating themselves. So they might um, 
have no idea that they just said something twice. So again, if they do that, don't remind them because that'll make it worse. Just move on and just ignore it. Now, there's some recent information I want to share with you. Um, and I'm going to put the link down below of a video that I did on this topic. And basically, there was a um, researcher in 2006 that committed fraud on this area of Alzheimer's and fabricated data that wasn't true. And this related to amyloid placking causing um, Alzheimer's. Because the problem is that even people without Alzheimer's has this placking and they don't have Alzheimer's. And so all the research money that has went to this theory, okay, and just has not been fruitful. I mean, I'm talking like millions and millions of dollars. And so now that casts a huge doubt on the actual cause of Alzheimer's. So there's some new theories about Alzheimer's that makes a lot of sense. And I did a whole video on it. And that relates to the lysosome. Now, what's a lysosome? Lysosome is a, it's a little part of the cell that like the garbage disposal. Okay. And so that part of the cell becomes dysfunctional in Alzheimer's uh, patients where the uh, cell cannot uh, get rid of the garbage. So the garbage keeps backing up. You can imagine in your house, if you never took out the garbage, okay, what would happen over a period of time? It's going to get really toxic. And that's exactly what happens with the neurons. And there's a lot more data I want to share with you on this lysosome, uh, this angle of the cause of um, Alzheimer's. Because right now, if you look at all the factors that align with that, it all makes total sense. What happens in the lysosome is a condition called autophagy. And autophagy is the recycling of you know, garbage to get fuel in the body and also to get new cells. And so I'm going to get into a, a little plan to give you to show you how to improve autophagy. But the current theory that makes the most sense with the cause of Alzheimer's is a dysfunctional autophagy or lysosome situation. You know, there's mixed data about this, uh, that there's certain specific genes that will cause Alzheimer's. But since Alzheimer's is multifaceted, there's a lot of different aspects to it and multiple causes, there could be multiple genes that you can have mutations with that can cause this problem. Let me explain. Like, for example, many strokes that can create a type of Alzheimer's called vascular Alzheimer's. There's other causes where you have brain injury from some other cause. And then there's another angle where you can have a problem with um, methylation. And without trying to get too complex, basically, if you have a problem with methylation, you're going to build up a lot of heavy metals in the brain. And that could be aluminum or even lead or even iron. And that can create Alzheimer's. So with all these different causes, you have related genes that are involved with those causes. And so recently, a lot of people are getting their DNA tested. And knowing your DNA, as far as what mutations you have, it doesn't necessarily tell you you're going to have that problem. It just tells you you have weaknesses within the genes. So I think it's important to get that test, but also know if one of your grandparents had this problem or your parents had it, potentially you could have a weakness within your genetics, which doesn't mean you're going to get it. It just means that that gene could turn on at a certain point in your life, and then you could get it. But there are so many things you can do to bulletproof yourself to make sure that gene stays off. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So there are a number of genes that I've researched on this topic. I'm not going to kind of give you all the complexity, but I'll just talk about one of the genes. It's called APOE. And that gene has to do with turning on late stage Alzheimer's. So something you would get after age 65, but there's different forms of that gene. Okay. So you have the E2 version, which helps protect against Alzheimer's. And then you have the E4 version, which is different. If you have a problem with that gene, it will increase your risk of getting Alzheimer's by 15 to 25%. Okay. And then you have another version of this APOE uh, gene, which is the E3 version, which will not have any effect on Alzheimer's. So basically, if you get your DNA tested and you have a problem with that gene, um, specifically like E2 or E4, then it just tells you, you need to be doing things to bulletproof yourself right now. Now, there's another gene called APP that has a lot to do with what I said before on autophagy, which is that lysosome cleaning up all the garbage in the cell. If you have a problem with that, then you need to be doing a lot more autophagy and strengthening 
the cleaning out process because you have a problem with detoxification. If you don't do extra things, the cells become very, very toxic. And then there's other genes involving the methylation. And I touched on that a little bit, but if you have a problem with that gene, what you need to do to solve it is to take larger amounts of B12, not the synthetic version, but the natural version, as well as the natural version of folate. So what happens if you don't have this good methylation problem, you're going to build up heavy metals. Okay. You're going to have a hard time detoxifying mercury. So this tells us you shouldn't be eating certain types of fish. Okay. This tells us that you should be very careful about taking too much iron, especially iron in synthetic supplements, especially iron in enriched flour products. So understanding the weaknesses that you have can give you a lot of um, power in doing something about it because now you're aware where your weak links are. Now, another heavy metal would be aluminum, right? And of course, the aluminum deodorants and aluminum pans should be avoided. So now the question is, okay, and I summarize this for you to make it really simple. Um, let's say you have problems with all, all of these genes, okay, that relate to dementia or Alzheimer's. What can you do? And this would be good for any person with Alzheimer's, there are very important actions you can take that are epigenetic actions, which are lifestyle actions that can help you control your genes. Just because a gene is mutated doesn't mean you're going to have a problem with it. Okay. So these genetic factors will keep things in check. Okay. Number one is to change the fuel that they're running on to the ketones. Okay. You want to run the brain on ketones. The brain loves ketones. It's a preferred fuel. And I'm talking about going from glucose to ketones. And the way you do that is putting the person on a low carb diet, as well as doing intermittent fasting. Okay. Both of those will induce ketones and it will support the brain, even if there's damage to the brain, because the first thing to go downhill with Alzheimer's is damage to the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is all about navigation, memory, and things like that. So a ketone fuel will bypass the damage, feed the neurons directly, because at the heart of the matter is a shrinking brain, a brain that's atrophying, a brain that has neurons that don't connect well anymore. And so they're starving of fuel. So if we feed them ketones, we will instantly see at least some good improvement. All right, number two you want to induce autophagy. Autophagy is not some cellular thing. It's a condition that you put your cells into so they can recycle garbage okay, and damage proteins. And the most potent way to stimulate autophagy is with fasting, okay? Regular intermittent fasting with periodic prolonged fasting. But you can also induce autophagy with exercise, so you don't even have to go to a gym to exercise. You can be exercising at your home, doing a mild version of it, you know, stretching, things like that. But any exercise is better than no exercise. The next thing is green tea. The phytonutrient in green tea, EGCG, can greatly help you and also induce autophagy. Curcumin is another really good natural phytonutrient in turmeric that can help induce autophagy. Number three, Omega-3 fatty acids, specifically the EPA and the DHA, which your brain desperately needs. And I would recommend getting it from cod liver oil. Uh, make sure if you're getting your omega-3 from fish that you do the least amount of heavy metals or mercury as possible, because what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate all these extra things that can create problems. And that would be number four, reduce heavy metals. Okay. So you're going to have to understand what fish that you can eat and what fish you can't. Selenium is the trace mineral that helps reduce mercury. So if you do have fish, maybe you take selenium at the same time to lock up that mercury so it doesn't become a problem. Distilled water is something I would also recommend. Um, unfortunately, this might be a pain, but to get one of those distillers where you have uh, stainless steel, okay? and not the plastic jug, but glass. And you can make your own distilled water and consume a good amount of the water being distilled water. Why? Because you have to realize what is in tap water. I mean, and even like even filtered water, just still all sorts of chemicals. When you distill it, you remove everything. And so it's a really good way of 
drinking pure water without the heavy metals, as well as pulling out metals from your body. Okay, it's a great detox. And then you can just put the minerals that you want back in. So that's really important. Make sure uh, you don't take uh, supplements that are synthetic because a lot of times it has the wrong type of iron and that can really mess with all sorts of things because we don't want these synthetic vitamins and we don't want these elemental minerals from supplements. So it has to be really like food-based or, or plant-based type nutrition, not food. I'm talking about the supplements themselves. Make sure that they're really like food-based. Number five, methylation. I mentioned on that, B12. Okay, you need a lot more B12. You can get a supplement with B12 and folate if you have this problem. And so there's a real simple genetic test to see if you have a problem with methylation. Okay, but then the solution is simple, B12 and folate. Number six, medications. Okay, if your loved one is on medications, you need to work with the doctor to get them off. Because even with my mother-in-law, we found that she was on incontinence medication and she was on all these things that had side effects of memory loss. So once we made those changes, she did a lot better. Okay, it didn't resolve the problem, but it improved the problem. Then we have number seven, vitamins. Now, these specific vitamins have a direct effect over your genes, okay? So we have vitamin A. I'm not talking about beta carotene, the precursor. I'm talking about actual retinol from things like liver and egg yolk, cheese, things like that. Then we have vitamin D, which will improve things like inflammation in your brain. And then there's B1, okay? Don't get the synthetic version. Make sure it's from natural sources like nutritional yeast. B1 is probably the most important vitamin for the hippocampus, which is the first area of the brain to shrink when you have dementia. Vitamin C, if you take an Alzheimer's patient, they're nearly always deficient in vitamin C. So vitamin C is really important too. I would not get the synthetic version. I would get a food base or just eat foods high in vitamin C. The top vitamin C food, believe it or not, is sauerkraut. Vitamin E, a very powerful antioxidant, not just good for the heart, very good for your brain, especially the structures of the brain that relay uh, you know, memories, things like that. And then we have vitamin K1. And this is interesting because people who are on like Coumadin drugs, which basically block vitamin K1, um, have a higher risk of getting Alzheimer's than people that don't. And you get a lot of vitamin K1 from dark leafy green vegetables. And then number eight, lion's mane, which is a mushroom. And it even has regenerative properties for brain tissue, as well as neuroprotective properties as well. But a lot of people who have dementia report amazing changes when they take lion mane. Now, if you haven't seen this video on Alzheimer's that I actually talk about the amyloid plaque not being the cause for it, you should definitely check that one out next. Very important. I put it right here.